Why would someone be confined in a glass box? If you've ever heard of terrifying criminals, you might have encountered Robert Maudsley, who is also known as the UK's most evil prisoner. In 1974, Maudsley committed his first murder, setting off a string of horrific crimes. Over the years, while serving a life sentence for one murder, he was involved in three additional killings within prison walls. Isn't that shocking? Can you believe this? He killed his inmates with a plastic spoon. I spent 23 hours every day in here, and uh, I've done so for almost four years. It's true to say my whole world revolves around the actual cell itself. Later, he was confined to a glass box, where he had to stay for 23 hours daily. Also, there are claims that he even consumed a portion of one victim's brain, leading to him being dubbed with nicknames like Hannibal the Cannibal and the Brain Eater by the British media. But what was the motive behind his killings? What makes his case so extraordinary? Join us as we unravel the unsettling story of Robert Maudsley, a man so dangerous that even conventional prison walls couldn't contain him. So, are you prepared to journey into this dark story? Then get ready for a chilling adventure through the life of the most evil prisoner kept in a glass box. Let's get started. On June 26, 1953, Robert Maudsley was born in Liverpool. He was the fourth child of 12 siblings. His father, Coleman George Maudsley, was a truck driver, and his mother, Jane, was a housewife. Tragically, before turning two, Maudsley, along with his siblings Paul, Kevin, and Brenda, were placed in foster care after authorities identified them as victims of parental neglect. Can you believe this? As a child, Maudsley spent much of his early years at Nazareth House, a Roman Catholic orphanage managed by nuns in Liverpool. Throughout this period, he developed strong ties with his brothers, yet had limited interaction with his parents, who made infrequent visits. Isn't this unbelievable? How can parents be so heartless as to neglect their child so much that they have to go to foster care? So, several years later, after having one more child, his parents decided to bring the first four siblings back home. However, what followed was a shocking turn of events, as it marked the beginning of a horrific campaign of physical abuse. Isn't that shocking? How could parents treat their own children so badly? Children looked to their parents for love and protection, yet some, like Maudsley and his siblings, face unimaginable cruelty and beatings instead. In an interview, Maudsley's brother, Paul, recalls, At the orphanage, we had a great relationship. Our parents visited occasionally, but they felt like strangers. The nuns were like family, and we stuck together. But when our parents took us home, everything changed. We were subjected to physical abuse, something we had never experienced. They singled us out, beat us, and sent us to our rooms. He then said the worst was for Robert Maudsley. All I recall from our childhood is the constant beatings, he recalls. Once, Maudsley was confined to a room for six months. My father only opened the door to enter and strike him four or six times a day. He used sticks and rods, and at one point, even broke a 22 air rifle over his back. Following the revelation of their parents' cruelty, social workers intervened and took Maudsley back into foster care. Meanwhile, his father deceived the rest of the family by falsely claiming that Maudsley was dead. Maudsley's life took a dramatic turn when he was taken away from his abusive parents and placed into foster care again. This was the time when an innocent child slowly got drawn into criminal activities. So when he turned 16, he fled from foster care and went to London. Alone in London, he got involved in a dark world of drug addiction. With no one to turn to and nowhere to go, it was a desperate move. As his addiction worsened, he resorted to working on the streets to feed his habit. He was admitted to psychiatric hospitals multiple times after several suicide attempts. He consistently reported to doctors that he heard voices instructing him to harm his parents. Despite getting help, the voices didn't stop. This made him feel even worse. Every time he left the hospital, the same thing happened again. He felt trapped and didn't know what to do. Subsequently, 
he began working in the sex industry to support his drug habit. It was during this time, in 1974, that he encountered his first victim, marking the beginning of a series of heinous acts that would shock the world. Can you believe it? Maudsley was just 21 when he committed his first murder. In 1974, a man named John Farrell hired Robert Maudsley as a sex worker, not knowing the horrors that would follow. Maudsley, driven by his drug addiction, saw this as an opportunity to make money. Little did anyone know this encounter would lead to Maudsley's first crime. On March 14, 1974, John Farrell hired Maudsley, who was 21 years old at the time, as a rent boy and brought him back to his apartment in North London for sexual activities. However, when Farrell revealed to Maudsley photographs of a young girl he had sexually abused, Maudsley became enraged and slowly strangled him, causing Farrell's face to turn blue. But why did he get angry at Farrell? So, Robert Maudsley's anger towards John Farrell stemmed from Farrell's flaunting of photographs depicting his sexual abuse of children. This encounter, which occurred on March 14, 1974, triggered Maudsley due to his own history of childhood abuse. So he killed him with no regret. The following year, Maudsley confessed to the police that he had killed Farrell. However, instead of putting him on trial, they sent him to psychiatric care at Broadmoor Hospital. They believed he was too ill to face trial. He was confined there for three years, receiving treatment for his mental health issues. However, despite efforts to rehabilitate him, his condition continued to deteriorate. So what happened next would cement his reputation as one of Britain's most evil criminals. After his time at Broadmoor Hospital, Maudsley's actions took an even darker turn. Instead of rehabilitation, he committed a series of gruesome murders within the confined walls. So this is what he did next. In 1977, while at Broadmoor Hospital, Maudsley and inmate David Cheeseman tortured a fellow prisoner, David Francis, who was a convicted child molester, for nine hours until he died. They tortured him relentlessly for nine grueling hours, subjecting him to unimaginable suffering. Shockingly, they used nothing but a plastic spoon to carry out the killing. The brutal act stunned everyone in the hospital and outside. They used a simple plastic spoon to kill their fellow prisoner, which shocked people even more. It made everyone wonder if the hospital was safe enough and if mental health care was working properly. But how did they kill Francis with a spoon? During the brutal assault, Maudsley used a spoon as a weapon, forcefully plunging it into Francis's ear with such force that it penetrated deep into his brain. This act of violence was not only a violation of Francis's physical integrity, but also a shocking display of aggression. The attack was so severe that it caused significant damage to Francis's ear and brain, potentially leading to his death. So when the guards heard the noise, they immediately broke the door and found the dead body of Francis. His head was terribly injured, like it had been cracked open, and there was a spoon sticking out. Even more shocking is that a guard said that Maudsley had eaten some of the man's brain. This made people think of him as a cannibal, even though it turned out that this scary detail was not true. He was then sent to Wakefield Prison, also called Monster Mansion, after getting a life sentence for manslaughter. There, people started calling him cannibal and brain eater right away. Did you know? Robert Maudsley earned the nickname Hannibal the Cannibal due to a false rumor that he had eaten part of a victim's brain during a brutal assault in prison. Despite the autopsy report disproving these brain-eating rumors, the sensationalized nickname persisted in the British press, contributing to Maudsley's infamous reputation. His terrible acts showed how dangerous he was and how hard it was to control him, even in confinement. Despite his confinement, he was still able to commit terrible acts, and his reputation as a dangerous and unpredictable inmate made him a figure of fear and fascination in the criminal justice system. However, his criminal actions didn't stop there. They worsened as time went on. In a shocking revelation, it's been said that in Wakefield Prison, Maudsley told his fellow inmates he wanted to kill seven people in one day. This revelation startled those around him, 
raising concerns about the extent of his dangerous intentions and making everyone worried about what he might do next. On July 29, 1978, in a shocking turn of events, the criminal went on a violent spree here, killing two other inmates in one day. In the prison, he had a fellow inmate named Salni Darwood, who was serving a life sentence for killing his wife, Blanche. So, the first person he killed was Salni Darwood, who was 46 years old. He tricked Darwood into coming into his cell. Subsequently, he strangled and stabbed the victim using a knife crafted from a soup spoon. After the attack, Maudsley hid Darwood's body under a bunk, leaving it concealed from view. It's unclear how long Darwood's body remained hidden, but the fact that Maudsley was able to keep it hidden for any length of time is a testament to his ability to manipulate and deceive. After hiding Darwood's body, Maudsley didn't stop there. He went on to kill another inmate on the same day. This shows just how dangerous and unpredictable he was, even within the confines of prison. He now went to kill another inmate who was serving seven years for assaulting a seven-year-old girl. He then entered 56-year-old Bill Roberts' cell while he was lying down and cruelly hit his head against a wall. He then used a spoon he had made into a weapon to crack open his skull. Afterward, he calmly walked to the wing office and informed the guards. There will be two short on the roll call. The guards were really surprised by what Maudsley did and how calm he was about it. They quickly tried to help the man he hurt, but it was too late. Maudsley's violent act shocked everyone in the prison, and it made people even more afraid of him. It's unclear how he managed to kill another inmate so soon after the first murder, but it's likely that he was able to use his cunning and manipulative skills to his advantage. He may have been able to gain the trust of other inmates, only to turn on them in a brutal and violent way. This incident further solidified Maudsley's reputation for extreme violence and led to his continued segregation within the prison system. Although Maudsley was found guilty of murder, he was surprisingly transferred back to Wakefield Prison. However, due to his extreme violence and danger to other inmates, he was completely isolated and unable to interact with anyone else for both their safety and his own. Afterward, Maudsley was kept in even tighter confinement, away from everyone else. But people couldn't forget what he had done. It was a scary reminder of the danger that was always there in the prison. After killing three inmates, he was then called Britain's most evil prisoner. So this was when he was sent to a glass box for the rest of his life. So after Maudsley's two more killings in the prison, authorities were worried that he might be a threat to other inmates in the prison. Because of this, authorities made a shocking decision to put him in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. By 1983, it was clear that regular cells couldn't keep him under control. So they built a special unit just for him in the prison's basement. This decision showed just how serious the situation had become. It was like something out of a thriller movie, with Maudsley being kept away from everyone else, deep underground, to keep everyone safe. Isn't that shocking? He was confined to an 18-foot by 15-foot cell, which included a smaller cell within it. This inner cell had thick glass walls through which his meals were passed to him, keeping him isolated from others even during his basic routines, like eating. It was a way to make sure he couldn't harm anyone else, but it also showed just how much they wanted to keep him away from everyone else because of his violent behavior. This level of confinement was incredibly strict, showing just how much authorities feared Maudsley's potential for violence. Being confined to such a small space, with even his meals being passed through thick glass walls, emphasized the extreme measures taken to ensure the safety of others around him. Even more shocking is that he was only allowed to leave prison for one hour for exercise. Whenever he left his cell, he was always accompanied by four or six prison officers. Can you believe it? At the age of 70, Maudsley spends a staggering 23 hours every day locked inside a cell. His bed, just a hard concrete slab, and if that's not grim enough, the toilet and sink are both bolted to the floor. It's a truly bleak existence. In a shocking development, Monsley is now considered very dangerous. 
he's kept away from other prisoners and guards, spending all his time alone in a glass box deep in the prison. He won't ever be free again and stays in the small see-through room he's lived in for many years. So, what is that glass box made of? The cell contains large bulletproof windows, a table and chair made from compressed cardboard, and a toilet and sink firmly fixed to the floor. A robust metal door opens to a tiny compartment within the cell, encased in thick perspex. A small opening at the bottom allows food to be delivered to him. Monsley's world became confined to the four walls of his cell, with limited interaction and little exposure to the outside world. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years, all spent in solitary confinement. Imagine being alone like that for so long. It's hard to know what he was thinking or feeling during all that time. But his story shows just how tough it can be to be cut off from other people for such a long time. So, you might be wondering what was his motive behind all these killings. Let's get into that. In his final murder trial in 1979, the courtroom was stunned to hear that during his violent actions, Maudsley actually thought his victims were his parents. His lawyers argued that the killing stemmed from pent-up rage built up from enduring constant abuse during his childhood. Maudsley said, During my violent acts, I think about my parents. If I had taken their lives in 1970, none of these other people would have had to die. If I had done so, I would be a free man today without any worries. In the mid-1990s, psychiatrist Dr. Bob Johnson visited Wakefield Jail. In a shocking revelation, Dr. Johnson, feeling a sense of duty as a doctor, decided to uncover the reasons behind Maudsley's transformation into a serial killer. Surprisingly, it took him 20 years to disclose their meetings for the first time. Maudsley recounted his terrifying childhood experiences, saying, My childhood memories are dominated by the beatings I received. I recall being confined in a room for six months, with my father only opening the door to enter and assault me four or six times a day. Isn't that disturbing? His childhood abuse has made him a serial killer. In a shocking revelation, it's also revealed that Maudsley has consistently claimed that his victims were rapists, pedophiles, or sex offenders. Maudsley's revelation about his victims raises troubling questions about the true motives behind his crimes. Despite the severity of his actions, it's clear that his troubled upbringing and experiences of abuse have left a lasting impact on his psyche. Yet, it's crucial to remember that such trauma, while deeply influential, does not excuse or justify his violent behavior. It's a reminder that understanding why people commit crimes is complex and challenging. His isolation in the glass box was so extreme that he went without a haircut for an astonishing 12 years. Why? Because no prison barber dared to approach him. Everyone was scared of him. The refusal of even a basic grooming service highlighted the extreme measures taken to contain and manage a man whose reputation for violence and brutality had become legendary within the prison walls. Even though he was alone, his reputation made everyone uneasy. Some guards said he sometimes showed kindness or intelligence, but most people were scared of him because of his violent past. During his initial days in solitary confinement, Maudsley reportedly formed a bond with cockroaches, finding solace in their presence. Guards saw him talking to cockroaches. Maudsley's health has declined in recent years, and there are concerns about his mental health. Despite this, he remains in solitary confinement, with no prospect of ever being released. Isolated within his cell, Maudsley occupies himself by writing letters and composing poems addressed to his nephew Gavin, who faithfully visits him in prison. In a letter, the 70-year-old Maudsley expressed, The prison authorities see me as a problem, and their solution has been to put me into solitary confinement and throw away the key to bury me alive in a concrete coffin. In 2000, he pleaded with the courts to let him die. In one of his letters, he wrote, What purpose is served by keeping me locked up 23 hours a day? Why even bother to feed me and to give me one hour's exercise a day? Who actually am I a risk to? He even wrote in his letter that, due to his current situation and solitary confinement, 
He fears that he is on a path towards mental decline, illness, and potentially suicide. He asked why he could not have his pet budgie instead of the cockroaches and spiders he currently has. He said that he promised to take good care of it and not harm it. In his letter, he also explained why he couldn't have a television in his cell to keep up with the world and expand his knowledge. Why can't he have access to some music tapes and enjoy beautiful classical music? He also wrote that if the prison service refuses, then he requests a simple cyanide capsule that he will willingly take. This way, the issue of Robert John Maudsley can be resolved quickly and easily. But in a shocking turn of events in 2021, Maudsley's appeal to integrate into the general prison population was denied. Prison authorities have made the chilling determination that he poses too grave a threat to be allowed contact with other inmates. As a result, he will spend the remainder of his days confined to his glass cell, isolated from the outside world and anyone within the prison walls. Gavin Maudsley, Robert Maudsley's nephew from Liverpool, shared on Channel 5's Evil Behind Bars that his uncle had come to terms with his situation. Gavin mentioned that Robert preferred to be alone because he was aware of the dangers around him. He expressed Robert's intentions to target sex offenders, as he believed they deserved punishment. Gavin clarified that while he doesn't support Robert Mondley's actions, he emphasized that Robert's victims were individuals he considered to be very bad people, not innocent. This highlights the complexities of Maudsley's case and the ongoing debate about the appropriate treatment of violent offenders. Despite his isolation, Maudsley has maintained contact with the outside world through letters. He has also expressed remorse for his actions and has spoken about his desire to be rehabilitated. However, his violent tendencies have persisted even within the confines of prison, where he has committed additional murders. Can you believe this? A prison officer from one of Britain's toughest prisons has shocked many by suggesting that Hannibal the Cannibal, a notorious serial killer, should be removed from solitary confinement. Neil Samworth, who has worked at HMP Strangeways in Manchester for over a decade, is of the opinion that Robert Maudsley should no longer be confined in isolation in his glass cell. In one of his interviews, he said, I think it's wrong the way he has been treated. He is in total isolation, and it's not fair. He also said, yes, he has had lots of fights in the past, but he is an old man now. He even said it was not fair to keep him in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. He should be given a chance to live a more normal life in prison, even if it is in a high security wing with other dangerous prisoners. Samworth's comments have sparked a debate about the treatment of long-term prisoners and the use of solitary confinement. Some argue that Maudsley's isolation is necessary due to the danger he poses to others, while others believe that it is inhumane and amounts to psychological torture. In Maudsley's case, his isolation has been particularly severe, with limited human contact and sensory stimulation. This has likely contributed to his deteriorating mental health and behavioral problems. He even said that Maudsley's case is unique in that he has been held in solitary confinement for over 40 years, a situation that is highly unusual and arguably unjust. While he has committed horrific crimes, it is important to consider his human rights and the long-term effects of isolation on his mental health. A notorious serial killer, Robert Maudsley, from Liverpool, has marked his 50th consecutive Christmas in confinement. Is that not astonishing? Maudsley, who is now 70 years old, has become the longest serving inmate in the UK's penal system. He has been separated from other prisoners for 45 years, which is believed to be a world record. Maudsley's crimes were particularly heinous, and he was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He was convicted for the murders of four men, but it is believed that he may have killed up to 10 people. Maudsley's crimes are nothing short of heinous. Convicted of murdering four men, his name sends shivers down the spines of those who hear it. Yet there are whispers of even more victims, suggesting a darker, more sinister side to his already gruesome tale. Despite his age, the passage of time has not lessened the shock and horror surrounding Maudsley's actions. 
Each year that passes serves as a grim reminder of the lives he has taken. As time passes, Maudsley's name remains linked to his awful crimes, reminding everyone of the scary side of humanity. Maudsley will remain jailed for the rest of his life, until he dies behind bars, serving as a reminder of the consequences of his actions and the impact they have had on his life and the lives of those around him. His life has been defined by extreme violence and isolation, as he has spent over 16,600 consecutive days alone in a bulletproof cell. His long years of isolation and confinement underscore the lasting impact of his crimes and the need for effective measures to address violent behavior. When we examine the life of Robert Maudsley, we are confronted with the chilling reality of a man consumed by darkness. His journey from a troubled childhood to becoming Britain's most evil prisoner is a testament to the profound impact of trauma and isolation. Robert Maudsley, a mass murderer serving a life sentence for brutally ending the lives of four individuals, will spend the rest of his days in a specially constructed glass box. Maudsley's existence in his glass box beneath Wakefield Prison serves as a haunting reminder of the depths of human depravity and the length society will go to contain it. His story, though unsettling, compels us to confront the complexities of the human psyche and the importance of understanding and addressing mental health issues. In the end, while Maudsley's actions may never be justified, his tale serves as a cautionary reminder of the darkness that resides within us all. This concludes this unique story. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications to stay updated on future content. Be sure to explore our other fascinating videos as well. Thank you for watching. Until next time.